Hi, welcome back to Carbohydrates and Biochemistry. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, so in the last video, we looked at aldo and keto hexosis, and we looked at their cyclizations and discussed why they occurred, and just showed kind of how they occur also. We're going to do the same thing now for aldoses and ketoses, but now we're going to look at carbohydrates with five carbons, and those are termed pentoses. All right, so let's jump in um, right where we started before. All right, this is an aldose. It's actually specifically D-ribose. Okay, so this is position one, two, three, four, and five. Um, ribose has five carbons, so that's what we expect. Like I mentioned in the last video, if you have an aldose, um, carbon one is typically the aldehyde. And sometimes they abbreviate it as CHO for aldehyde, but generally it's going to help us much more to draw out the aldehyde because if you're actually drawing a mechanism of this, you want the carbonyl to be visible. So this is the aldehyde. So one, two, three, four, and five. So we're going to do this cyclization reaction very much the same way we did in the last video. And like I said, I'm going to assume that you have an understanding of Fisher projections and these over here, which are more of Hayworth projections. Um, but if you need help with that, go back and watch the video earlier in the playlist where we do examples of those with carbohydrates. I'm going to assume that you have an understanding of that and we're going to jump right into this. So I will go ahead and tell you, and you might have seen this already if you've done anything on DNA or RNA, nucleic acids, but ribose is most stable in a five-membered ring. Um, you see ribose right here. So one, two, three, four, five. It turns out that the oxygen that does the nucleophilic attack is the fourth carbon. So this, carb or this oxygen is going to attack here, that carbonyl carbon, and that is what ultimately gives you the cyclization. And it's going to cyclize into a five-membered ring. Okay. Now there's one other thing I want to show you. All right. I'm going to do this in yellow since this is in yellow over here. Suppose instead I did this oxygen doing the attack, position 5, and that attacks the carbonyl. That's going to give you this one on the right. Now let's talk about the true form of ribose. This is beta d ribofuranose. Remember that furanose implies a five-membered carbohydrate ring. That's what we see here, this pentagon right here with the oxygen at the top, a furanose. Okay? If I did the second attack in yellow, I would actually get a six-membered ring, and that would be beta d ribopyranose. It is possible that there's a very, 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 very negligible amount that this will actually exist. Um, it's not useful, though. Okay? It can exist in a very, 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 very small concentration, but the equilibrium drastically favors the furanose form to where there should only be a negligible amount of the pyranose. The reason for that has a lot also to do with stability, okay? When you have this ribofuranose, there's a lot of hydrogen bonding, and when you have the ribopyranose, that hydrogen bonding is reduced. And so overall, there's a lot less stability for the ribopyranose. The other reason that it has a tendency of being more unstable has to do with the fact that it's not a huge contribution, but I have this atom right here, that's an exposed carbon that actually adds some hydrophobicity to the molecule. Okay, it adds a little bit of hydrophobicity, and that also makes it less stable since we're dealing with an aqueous environment. So for the most part, we are not even going to consider this. We're only going to consider the ribofuranose. All right? So it's carbon-4. This oxygen does the nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl, and you get cyclization or cyclization to beta d ribofuranose. And it's furanose because it has a five-membered ring. Other thing that I want to point out and make sure that you understand, remember this hydroxymethyl group goes up, and on the anomeric carbon, this OH goes up. They're going the same direction, so that means this is beta. And beta in ribose is also more stable. Okay. Now, that was an aldopentose. Let's look at, look at a ketopentose, and we're going to look at one that's very similar to ribose, the ketopentose version of it is called ribulose. Make sure you distinguish that from ribose. This is ribulose. Okay. Ribulose has the potential for cyclization, but it really doesn't occur a lot. We'll talk about why that is. It really doesn't occur a lot. Now, if you did this with this oxygen right here, so if we label these again, this is one, two, three, four, and five. If you do this with 
position four, so one, two, three, four, I would go ahead and tell you, if you did it with oxygen on position four, and let me just go ahead and show you what that would be. So be this attacking that. You would get a four-membered ring, okay? If you wanted to draw or draw it out, what it would look like, you can prove it to yourself, but you would get a four-membered ring. Recall for your organic rules that four-membered rings are very unstable. They have a lot of ring slash angle strain, and they're not stable at all. So the four-membered ring would not be favored at all here, okay? Now, if we look at the bottom oxygen, which is really how the cyclization should occur, this oxygen will attack the carbonyl, and that's actually what gives you this. Beta D ribulofuranos. Beta D ribulofuranos. Now, it's different. This is not beta D ribofuranos. You have to add this UL in there, which designates it as the keto version. Beta D ribulofuranos. Okay? One thing that you'll notice here is just like in the case of beta D ribopyranos, beta D ribulofuranos has a carbon in here that's exposed without any OH group on it. Okay? It will turn out, as, as you'll find, that that makes this a little bit unstable. Okay? It is a five membered ring, but the fact that there's no OH there makes this a little bit less stable. Okay? Now, this cyclization does occur. This cyclization actually does occur. However, it occurs to a much lesser extent. If you actually go into your biochemistry textbook, and I challenge you to do this right now, and you find the, the chapter that includes the pentose phosphate pathway, all right? There's actually a pentose phosphate pathway that occurs in you. It should be around the glycolysis chapter, after glycolysis that usually discusses it. And there's actually a reverse pentose phosphate pathway in um, the photosynthesis chapter. And you're going to find derivatives of ribulose, something like ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, or something like that. But it's ribulose with some extra phosphates on it. And what you're going to find is that it's in the straight chain form. You really don't find ribulose in the cyclic form. Okay? If you did, it would be most stable in the ribulofuranose form. It can't form a pyranose. There's no way this can form a pyranose. It cannot be a six-membered ring. It's impossible for this molecule. But if it did cyclize, it would prefer the furanose ring, but it's even, it's even a little unstable there because of that exposed carbon, okay? So in general, when you find ribulose, the keto pentose version, um, or a derivative, it will actually prefer to be in the straight chain, the linear. And that's a little bit unusual, but that just has to do with the fact that in the furanose form, it has this exposed carbon, okay, which makes it a little unstable. All right, so hopefully this made a little bit of sense. This is really just discussing the cyclization reactions that can occur. Some key points that I want to sum up between this video and the last video, okay? Remember, it's, it's a little bit of organic, but... Six-membered rings and five-membered rings are the most stable. The one that is more stable depends on the carbohydrate, generally. Back up here, this is a little bit of a review from the previous video. Pyranose's six-membered carbohydrate rings tend to be more stable for aldohexoses. Furanose rings, five-membered carbohydrate rings, tend to be more stable for ketohexoses, like fructose. Xylulose is another example, okay? When we get to the um, pentoses, generally they are almost stable in the furanose form, okay? Deoxyribose, ribose, and some of the other ones that you'll find, you won't really ever see those in the six-membered ring form. You just won't. They're too unstable. They're most stable in the furanose form, okay? And that's really a general rule, and some of them really don't cyclize at all like ribulose that we saw down here, okay? Um, the other thing also to keep in mind is that in general, and this, is, this really tends to be true, they don't form four-membered rings or less, and they don't form seven-membered rings or higher. You either have to choose between five-membered rings or six-membered rings. And remember, one thing you can also do is you can count the carbons or atoms in general to see which ones, which oxygen does the attack. If I know glucose is a six-membered ring, 
I can say this is this is atom, this oxygen is one, it's attacking atom two, three, four, five, and six. And I kind of form this cycle right here, that's six atoms. And so you can determine that that, that oxygen was, was the one that attacked, okay? If I had done this oxygen in yellow down here, I would have counted seven atoms, thus a seven-membered ring, which doesn't form because it's too unstable due to angle strain, okay? So hopefully this makes a little bit of sense. Um, in the next video, we're going to go over more properties of carbohydrates. See you in the next video.